I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German monk. So cold. Tell me about him, Francis. He's intoxicated with himself. Sober him. Lighten up, Francis. Lighten up, Francis. You know that joke's only good while the Pope's the Pope. Sober him. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade, I suppose a reboot of a formerly weekly theological podcast where we sit down at the kitchen table, grab ourselves an ice-cold, frosty brew, and we talk about theology. Lutheran Lemonade, to gladden the heart of man. I am Ryan, and I have been away (sighs) for a while. We might talk about that in this episode of Lutheran Lemonade, but... On this episode of Lutheran Lemonade, we are talking about the end of the world. That's right. Where can you find Lutheran Lemonade? Well, formerly you could find it on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. However, that is going to be changing. Uh, I really can't afford $16 a month for a SoundCloud subscription anymore, and that uh, is actually tied to the reason I've been away from YouTube as long as I have. Um... But uh, I am I am cultivating some options, uh, some free options to put SoundCloud uh, audio only online, and uh, so that'll be happening in the future. So for the time being, uh, Lutheran Lemonade uh, can be found on YouTube.com at fifteen seventeen films. Just look for that circle with fifteen seventeen in it and the word films on the bottom, and you found it. You can also check out all sorts of other cool things at fifteen seventeen films, like I don't know, story of our faith or. Gosh, what else am I doing? Ah, Liturgy 101. And of course, you know, timely topics like kind of this one is. Uh, you can find things on incense and home altars and stuff like that. I'm uh, turning the the wheels and uh, you can hear it. You can see the smoke. You can hear the, the squirrels. Turning the wheels on getting an episode on candles out pretty soon. The history of candles. So that'll be fun. But on this episode of Lutheran Lemonade, we have ourselves a nice, and this is a solid, <laughs> frosty beer. And we're going to talk about the end of the world. We're going to talk about the end of the world for a couple of reasons. Because if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that maybe we should be mindful of the end of the world. (laughs) Uh, This uh, coronavirus started very early on in uh, 2020. And while we were all distracted by a celebrity dying in a helicopter crash, the coronavirus had made chores in the United States. And now uh, many of us are still work from home. Uh, Many of us, depending on where we are in the country, may still be on lockdown. Many of us, depending on where we are, might have mandatory mask mandates. And let me tell you something, folks. It is not easy to sing a Lutheran hymn with a mask. So we've gotten to thinking about our own mortality, and some Christians are quite on the ball. Some Christians have pointed out that this coronavirus might actually be judgment from God. Yes, God indeed does judge his creation, but not out of wrath. No, 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 no. That wrath has been poured out onto his son so that we could have forgiveness of sins. God judges the world to move us to repentance. We recall the story of the tower that fell and the disciples asked who sinned and Jesus said, don't worry about that. Just you repent. You repent. So whenever we see tragedy, we should be moved to repentance. And this coronavirus has shown us that. And many a pastor has has said as much, look, this is judgment from God. My pastor said something quite interesting to me. He said, have you ever stopped to consider, Ryan, that maybe the coronavirus is a condemnation from God against his church, specifically? In the days of Moses, he said, God used the plagues of Egypt to tear down systematically all of the gods of Egypt, leaving in the end no god but himself. In a matter of fact, the last god that God tore down in the ten plagues was Pharaoh himself. He showed Pharaoh himself, you are not a god, by striking down his firstborn son. And, of course, uh, he struck down the cat god when he parted the Red Sea because cats can't swim. (laughs) Thank you for that brilliant joke, uh, Mr. Robin Williams. Uh, (laughs) Yes, so uh, then 
then what happens? Well, of course, it's an election year, at least in the United States. And so, of course, there's rioting and looting in the streets and burning down of cities. Even my home state of Wisconsin, middle America, is not, not, not exempt from this. Uh, about an hour and a half, two hours south of where I live, there have been riots for days. They have burned down large swaths of the city of Kenosha in my state of Wisconsin, and now people are dead. I happen to be watching that live when, when that happened, when a 17-year-old shot down his would-be attackers in self-defense. And of course, of course, through all of this rioting and looting and burning and mostly peaceful protests, <laughs> Christians are looking at it and going, what is happening? I mean, you think about it, there's a great theologian uh, who said uh, something very similar to the effect of, you know, there will come a time when mad people will look at us and go, "You're wh wh what's wrong with you? You're not mad like the rest of us. And that's what's going on. Christians, we sit back and we look at all of this and we go, is it the end? I mean, there's a, there's a global pandemic. There's a plague. Look at what's going on in California. They're on fire. There's earthquakes. The, the, the Gulf is getting hit by two hurricanes at the same time. What is going on? It has to be the end of the world. It's the end of the world, Ryan. It's the end of the world. Jesus is coming. You better get ready for the rapture. <laughs> now, I, <laughs> I chuckle at the concept of the rapture because I, as a teenager, was completely taken in by the deception of the Left Behind books. I read every single one of them, sometimes staying up all night and finishing a book. And, and spoiled rotten, reading through five, six of them, and then, or however many, I don't know, three or four maybe probably, and then having to wait for the next one to be released. I thought that was how the world was going to end. And I've seen any number of posts from friends online or on social media. I've seen countless YouTube videos of false prophets, be it the popular ones from the Trinity Broadcasting Network or just little run-of-the-mill bum hick pastors in their home office talking about how God gave me a vision of the end of the world in the next three months, blah, 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 blah. What they fail to point out is that none of them have seen the coronavirus coming. None of these prophets that give us prophet, words, words of the Lord for the month of whatever have ever told us about the coronavirus. But our, our young men are seeing visions and our old men are dreaming dreams, or however the verse they take out of context goes. The rapture is coming. This false hope that, that American Christians are putting in the doctrine of the rapture is, is, is really sad, if you ask me, because the ultimate hope, there's, there's, there, the ultimate hope is the suffering death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the ultimate hope. But, as the great hymn um, for all the saints declares, rightly, biblically, Lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day. A yet more glorious day. Christ shall return, and the dead in Christ shall be raised, and those who are alive on the day of his coming shall be raised to meet the Lord in the air. The resurrection of the dead. That is our hope, not that we get to die and our spirit gets to be in heaven with Jesus. No, the hope of the Christian during these difficult difficult times is that Jesus is crucified, dead, buried, and raised again, victorious over sin, death, the power of the devil. I have the forgiveness of sins because of what he has done for me, and I can go through this turmoil in peace and confidence because I have received freely as a gift the Lord's salvation. And though... They destroy my flesh. They cannot take away from me the kingdom of God. That's the hope of the Christian. And then, when they do destroy your flesh, when the coronavirus does destroy your flesh, or if you get killed by rioters in the streets, or, or you die in a wildfire or an earthquake or a hurricane, you meet the Lord. You go to Abraham's bosom. You go to heaven. And you worship the Lord in absolute peace in paradise until such time as you descend with him in the clouds to claim his own from the earth. 
and he reunites you with your body and he destroys heaven and he destroys earth and sin is ultimately finally judged condemned finished and cast into the lake of fire with the devil and the false prophet and the antichrist and we live and reign with him in a new heaven and a new earth for all eternity this dear christians is our hope in these tumultuous times don't we hear that on every radio ad during these uncertain times during these tumultuous times during this new normal oh but i want to pick up on the concept of the rapture so the rapture is this neat little doctrine that got invented in about the 1920s now bear in mind christianity started anywhere from 30 to 33 a.d so the first century in the 20th century, 20 centuries later, comes the doctrine of the rapture, that Christ will return in secret, and he will snatch up his believers. Where does this come from? Well, we go to the Gospel of Matthew, the 24th chapter, beginning at verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, Jesus says, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be, or so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Here's the verse. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake. for You do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, are we in the end times? Is Jesus coming back and coming back soon? No. Why? Maybe, but probably not. Why? Because we expect him to. Because we're waiting for it. Because this has to be it. But these verses right here, starting at verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Ryan, how on earth can you say there's no rapture? You read it yourself. Concerning that day, what day? (laughs) Well, we have to go back. So if you go back and you read the context and you read about the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD and you read about tribulation and and wars and rumors of wars and that great and terrible day of the lord that day but concerning that day the day that i come back so this one will be taken and the other will be left is not a reference to a secret rapture where jesus comes back halfway and then comes back again we're not waiting for a second and a third coming of christ we're waiting for the second coming the one he came once he is coming again that is the greatest mystery of the christian church is that the lord has come the lord has ascended the lord will come again that is that is the great mystery of our christian faith and we're going to come back to this uh two men will be in the field one will be taken the other will be left because it gets even better than this remember we're going to go to a few more verses but remember the principle of hermeneutics there are three rules to proper biblical exegesis context Context, context. Let's go to another verse. We're in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the coming of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, we're beginning in verse 13, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you, by word, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until his coming, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heavens with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ 
will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Well, damn it, Ryan. Look, this is, this is clear proof that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take us up. Well, hold on a minute. To meet the Lord in the air. That's another big reference uh, for the rapturists. The coming of the Lord. <sighs> this is captioned in, in most Bibles today in English. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. This is no secret. As lightning scatters itself across the sky and is seen from one side to the other, so too shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Does this sound like a secret? The cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Does this sound like a secret? Does this sound like you're going to be flying on a plane with Kirk Cameron and all of a sudden some old woman's going to look at you and go, Where's my husband? I think he ran off naked. <laughs> No, <laughs> we're going to be going along our merry way as we've always done, marrying and being given in marriage, eating and drinking, and all of a sudden, that's it. With a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, the Lord himself will descend with the clouds of heaven and everybody, and don't ask me how, but everybody on this ground globe will see the Lord descend with his church, and the dead in Christ will be raised. And once the dead in Christ are raised, we who are left alive at this great and terrible moment will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord, and we will forever be with the Lord. So that verse doesn't mean what you think it means. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 42. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is the first, but the natural. And then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of the dust, and the second man is from heaven. Is this right? I went too far. I went too far. Okay, so this, this, uh, uh, sorry, strike that, reverse it. Um, <laughs> we're not going to start at verse 42 in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we're going to start, where are we going to start? Uh, this is awkward. Why don't you have another drink, Ryan? This drunken little German monk cannot find his own Bible verse. <laughs> uh, uh, let's try this. There it is. Thank you, Control F. Verse 50, I was right, it's right there. Verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now we go back 
to Matthew. Is that where it was? No, it was uh, Thessalonians. Ah, oh, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God. And then we get to Corinthians, this rapture verse. There have been whole books and movies about in the twinkling of an eye, the secret rapture. Really? At the last trumpet. The last. You know how many trumpets there are in the book of Revelation? And you premillennial dispensationalists are going to turn to me and say, Ryan... This secret trumpet that only the Christians can hear. And then all the other trumpets and revelations after. No! The last trumpet. The final one. The end all be all. The end. After it is all said and done. Then Christ will return. He's not going to take his church. No! No! The church has not believed that until the 20th century when this Stupid little rapture doctrine was invented. But Ryan, Ryan, two men in a field. One will be left, one will be taken. Remember, the three rules to proper biblical exegesis. Context. 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 For as were the days of Noah. So Jesus is making a comparison. So will be the coming. Singular. Of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, cheers, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So, in the days of Noah, who was taken? Because rapture theology says that the Christians are going to be taken and everyone else is going to be left behind. Who was taken? Who was swept away? In the twinkling of an eye, the Christians are going to be swept away. Who was swept away in the flood? Everybody. Man, woman, and child, and everything that had the breath of life in its lungs. That's who. That's who was taken. So, so, just like this, so will be, just like this, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. You see, when the Lord descends at the final trumpet, with the command of the archangel, with that final trumpet blast, when he finally descends and he gathers the dead to himself and he gathers the living to himself and sets foot on this earth it is judgment day and then we turn to revelation for the dividing of the sheep and the goats and then who is taken at the great throne judgment the goats are taken to eternal damnation which was prepared for Satan and his angels, not for mankind. Hell was designed for Satan and his angels. So at the end, when Christ comes, gathers the church to himself en route, and sets foot on the earth and judges all of mankind, those who are the unrighteous, the unrepentant, will be taken to eternal damnation. But those who have been safe and secure in the ark of the church just like Noah and his family, when all is said and done, will be left. Left to the new heaven and the new earth and eternal paradise. No, friends, there is no rapture. Don't put your hope in the rapture. Put your hope in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for you. And don't worry. About, I mean, be cautious. Be respectful. Live in love and service to your neighbor. And heaven forbid, if it comforts the conscience of your neighbor just swallow your pride and put on a mask so be cautious respect the plague respect the pestilence respect the violence in the streets respect nature ripping itself asunder right now but these jesus says 
are just the beginning of birth pains. My neighbor and I were talking about the end. And um, I said, what if it's just Braxton Hicks? I mean, Jesus said he's coming soon. He said that 2,000 years ago. So obviously soon is a relative term. <laughs> we don't know when Jesus is coming. And so we live and we endure in these hard times and it's going to get worse. And the world is going to look at us and go, as the great saint of old once said, why are you not mad like us? Why are you not mad like us? So don't put your hope in the rapture. Put your hope in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for you. Know that you have been buried with him by baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life, that you have the forgiveness of sins, and that the trials and tribulations of this world cannot touch the kingdom that has been promised to you. And that even though whatever pestilence, plague, war, bloodshed, or famine claims your flesh. The kingdom of God belongs to you. And Christ will return and raise you from the dead. I'm watching a series. I'm going to end it this way. I'm watching a series from a pastor on the book of Revelation. And he's taking it <laughs> verse by verse. But in his very first series on this, he said, if you open the book of Revelation and you read anything out of it other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. You're interpreting the book wrong. The, the book of Revelation is not a checklist of things that need to happen. Oh my gosh. When I was in high school, and I was enthralled with these left behind books. We've come full circle, folks. And I was enthralled with these left behind books. <laughs> I thought the mark of the beast was barcodes <laughs> because the first dash the middle dash and the end dash are 666 well first of all folks 666 is way different than 600 three score and six okay it, it, it the way it's counted in greek and and it's it's call back to hebrew is entirely different than just 666 that's why the lady who thinks the monster logo is is the mark of the beast is stupid so now you're hearing people saying, oh, the, this Bill Gates microchip is the mark of the beast. Look, America is not the center of God's eschatological timetable. We're not. We are the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We are a beacon of hope, liberty, and freedom and justice for all. But we are not the center of God's eschatological table. We're not the center of the world in that regard. And I'm pretty sure the Mark of the Beast had way more to do with things that were going on with Emperor Nero than us today. Emperor Nero, the first of many Antichrists. Pope Francis, the current Antichrist. Because the Roman Catholic Church has anathematized the gospel. But the Council of Trent is another story. So, in closing, yes, these are tumultuous times, yes. We're burning our own cities to the ground. Yes, there are earthquakes. There's wars and rumors of wars. There's plague and pestilence and famine. There's war and bloodshed. There's desolation. There's rioting. There's looting. There's pillaging and plundering and burning and screaming and killing and rape and murder and abortion. And coronavirus. <laughs> really, all the evil that's been in the world all the evil that's in the world today and COVID-19 is proof that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. His word is his bond. His promises are secure. He's coming back. Just not today. Just, just not now. I don't think. I could be wrong. We expect it. We're waiting for it. Listen to the words of the prophets. A prophet is someone who declares a word from the Lord, right? Well, as, as the author of the book of Hebrews tells us, in many and various ways God has spoken to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. So those modern-day prophets are not the ones that are screaming on Trinity Broadcasting Network. They're not the ones in charismatic churches or on YouTube channels saying, I have a word from the Lord. A true prophet of God in these end times is the one that opens up the Bible and reads it to you. That's the prophecy that we are promised. They are reading to you the words of God. Trust them. Trust the pastor who tells you that Christ died for you. 
and that however bad it gets, he will come back for you even after you die, and he will raise you from the dead. Gosh, that was a long one. But when you've been away from Lutheran Lemonade for as long as I have, you gotta rant. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.